I'm very, very excited to introduce our, our next speaker. He's come all the way from the US of A and uh, is doing a uh, talk on the endocannabinoid system in health and disease. Ethan Russo, MD, is a board certified neurologist uh, in psychopharmacology, uh, so, and psychopharmacology researcher, sorry, and medical director of Phytex, a biotechnology company researching and developing innovative approaches targeting the human endocannabinoid system. From 2003 to 2014, he served as a senior medical advisor and study physician to GW Pharmaceuticals for three phase three clinical trials of Sativex for the allevi alleviation of cancer pain unresponsive to opioid treatment and studies of Epidolex for intractable epilepsy. He has held faculty appointments in pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Montana, in medicine at the University of Washington, and as a visiting professor at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He is a past president of the International Cannabinoid Research Society and former chairman of the International Association for Cannabinoid Medicines. He's an author of numerous books, book chapters, and articles on cannabis and ethnobotany and herbal medicine. I'm very looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dr. Ethan Rousseau. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Lucy and Lou and all the organizers for this opportunity. This talk is going to be somewhat technical. I would remind you that uh, this material will be available later. Uh, so there will be things I'm talking over rather rapidly, and that's not me being nervous, but rather in the interest of time and hopefully just whetting your appetite for going onward. Um, you'll see my email here, Ethan Russo at Comcast.net. I'd be happy to hear from you subsequently if you'd like materials sent to you about uh, the, these topics. So we're talking about cannabis sativa, but we're also going to explore how it works. And this is through a thing called the endocannabinoid system, among others. The story begins with a plant called cannabis. Uh, as you heard from Justin, it makes glandular trichomes, which you see uh, those little balls on the end of stalks. Um, and those produce THC and the other cannabinoids and terpenoids. In turn, THC binds to cannabinoid receptors. So your body has locks that have a key like THC or endogenous cannabinoids within the body that fit that receptor. Um, so they're also endogenous or endocannabinoids, uh, as you heard, anandamide and 2-arachidonoglyceride. Uh, that bind to this CB1 receptor. There are actually three kinds of cannabinoids. Uh, phytocannabinoids are the plant-based cannabinoids, and in general, these are 21 carbon items uh, from cannabis, uh, but there are also exceptions. Uh, other plants beyond cannabis have beta caryophylline that binds to a second cannabinoid receptor, CB2. Uh, the endocannabinoids are, again, within the body, uh, this system has been described as having functions including relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. And then there's synthetic cannabinoids, some of which were developed before we knew about the receptors and some afterwards. This simple schematic uh, shows how these work in the brain. Uh, very simply stated, the endogenous cannabinoids are produced on demand when needed they're in the postsynaptic neuron, the one in the bottom. Now, whereas neurotransmitters go forward, these go backward. And they t will lodge on the CB1 receptor where their main function in the brain is to reduce the release of neurotransmitters. So they are damping down whatever function that particular nerve cell had. Uh, as we heard, this is a system that's found throughout uh, the animal world uh, in chordates, things that have a back, backbone. Um, and um, so the endocannabinoid system itself has three components. The endogenous cannabinoids themselves, their receptors, CB1 and CB2 that I've mentioned, and also a third, 
uh, called the ionotropic cannabinoid receptor, TRPV1. That's where capsaicin, the active ingredient in chili peppers, works. And it also includes their enzymes, the ones that make them and break them down, because they can be, be manipulated pharmacologically and serve as medicines as well. As you've heard previously, there's an entourage effect. We have the main players, 2-AG and uh, anandamide, but additionally, there are a series of other compounds that the, um, are found in the body that on their own don't do a lot, but will synergize with this in what's called the entourage effect. So in a sense, we have soloists and we have supporting cast. In terms of the CB1, cannabinoid 1 receptor in the brain, it's found in many places, um, particularly in areas that are nociceptive, that have to do with mediating pain. But they're also in the cerebellum, uh, the limbic system involved with emotion, the basal ganglia with movement, and also in reward pathways, so the relationships of this system to how addictive drugs or other things that are addictive like sex and food also affect the system. Um, now, although there are certain areas in the brainstem, like the substantia nigra, the periaqueductal gray that have to do with pain, they are not in areas of the medulla that mediate respiration. So whereas uh, opioids cause death by people stopping breathing because of depression of the respiratory center, this cannot happen with a cannabinoid no, no matter how potent it is. And hence there's an inherent safety uh, in comparison to the opioids. But it's not just the brain where these work. They also work throughout the spinal cord, in the periphery, in the gut. It's important that you know that the CB1 receptor is the most abundant receptor, G-protein coupled receptor in the brain. And as, again, as mentioned, it modulates the function of the various neurotransmitters. If we have a system like glutamine, uh, glutamate, I'm sorry, that uh, is normally stimulatory and is overactive in neuropathic pain. If the cannabinoids damp down that response, you see how that would reduce the pain over time. Um, so in the brain, again, uh, this system modulates pain, memory, movement, whether someone will vomit or not, their seizure threshold, but also uh, many other functions in the body, including in the gut. I like to say that the brain and the gut speak the same language. Uh, cannabinoids modulate the propulsion, how fast things move through the gut, and the secretion, how much liquid or lack of liquid there is. It might interest you to know that one of the first treatments for cholera, a terrible kind of diarrhea, uh, in the 19th century was cannabis, quite successfully. I mentioned that there's an additional receptor, CB2. If we think of CB1 as being the psychoactive receptor, that causes, it explains the psychoactive effect of THC, there additionally is CB2 that's mainly found out in the body where it mediates pain and inflammation. But a drug that would only affect it would not produce a high. These drugs that would affect CB2 would be very promising in treating various fibrotic diseases, diseases that cause scarring in the liver or other organs. Additionally, we've got both kinds of receptors in the skin. Um, and this is a particularly uh, interesting area therapeutically in that it's very accessible. You don't have to get through a lot of layers um, to have this be active. And this is an area of quite a bit of current research. Interestingly, cannabidiol, which doesn't bind to these particular receptors with any affinity uh, also seems to be a great drug for the skin um, and a um, full spectrum cannabis extract uh, that had it would show antibacterial effects like in acne but additionally we know that cannabidiol works on yet another receptor called trip v4 and reduces the release of fat sebum uh, that contribute to acne.
Now, if we look at other areas in the body, you see this heartless person. Uh, we need to uh, change this diagram because uh, actually uh, cannabis and cannabinoids work on the heart as well, of course. Um, the bones that don't show up so well on this person either. Um, cannabidiol, for instance, was recently shown to stimulate bone fracture healing, and although uh, cannabinoids are banned from professional and amateur sports, it may be in the future that when an athlete breaks his or her leg that they get cannabidiol to speed the healing. Just briefly to look at the heart again, uh, it may be very familiar to you that uh, when someone tries cannabis for the first time, they may get a very rapid heart rate. Some of that is the excitement of the experience, but additionally, there's a pharmacological effect. Uh, interestingly, at a higher dose, the heart will actually slow down. It may slow down so much that the person can't maintain their blood pressure and will pass out from what's called orthostatic hypotension. In the past, there's been concern that um, there were studies that showed some people that had heart attacks uh, may have smoked cannabis uh, within a short period of time, but epidemiologically, looking at the sum total of cases, this is not an area uh, where we have cannabis being responsible for a lot of heart attacks. In an individual, it could have an effect. Um, but um, again, no strong signal. This one's been pretty much debunked. For some time, it was thought that there could be this cannabis arteritis. Arteritis would be a swelling of an artery such that blood couldn't get through. And you see a constriction uh, right well, this is not strong enough to show, uh, but the radiologists in the audience will pick out the point of blockage. Um, in fact, when this was carefully examined by my colleague, Franjo Grotenherm, and it was shown that all these people that had this so-called cannabis arteritis, arteritis also were smoking tobacco, which is known in certain individuals with a thing called Berger's disease to constrict the blood vessels and produce problems of this type. Now, as you're well aware, uh, the most common use of cannabis therapeutically is treating chronic pain conditions. And the way it does this is really quite multifactorial, and these are just a few of the ways in which it does it. Some are on neurotransmitters, some are through interactions with opioids, uh, whether they're taken uh, by pill or the endogenous opioid system. Uh, there are also direct effects in the brain um, and um, other components in cannabis beyond cannabidiol and THC. Um, the brain actually has a baseline level of endocannabinoid function. It's called endocannabinoid tone. So it's always at about this level. And under certain conditions, there could be less activity or more activity. Um, the endocannabinoid system is active in an area of the brain called the periaqueductal gray. For example, this is a migraine generator. I'll be talking about that more in a bit. It's also active in an area called the thalamus, the ventroposterolateral lateral nucleus. And if we test there, cannabinoids are 10 times more powerful in reducing pain than morphine is. So, uh, quite apparent why using the two together might be useful in a lot of clinical situations. Additionally, there are many mechanisms in the spinal cord uh, by which cannabinoids treat chronic pain, and you see some of the mechanisms listed here, wind up and allodynia. Uh, it may be that your doctor has trouble with these terms. We're not going to go into a lot of detail today, but I'd be happy to send you a book chapter. Uh, about this that explains better. Uh, additionally, this again works out in the periphery and can work on things like contact dermatitis from uh, an eruption if someone's exposed to poison ivy or the like, and just plain old itch. Now, I realize that the, these things are too small for you to read, but you may hear from people, particularly politicians, that there are no controlled trials of cannabis. Uh, and treating this or that condition. Well, this is quite false. This is just a listing of a few randomized controlled trials just of uh, Nibiximols, uh, which is the US adopted name for Sativex, 
which is available in 27 countries for treatment of spasticity and multiple sclerosis. Oddly, it was approved in Australia, but hasn't been available because of problems with cost and the fact that Novartis, that owns the rights to it, has not chosen to market it here. Um, so this is a problem, again, as you've heard, uh, if a medicine isn't accessible due to cost or politics, then it's no good to patients. But what I wanted to illustrate is, beyond the use in multiple sclerosis, there have been all these clinical trials, almost all positive, in treating chronic pain conditions with this agent. Um, unfortunately, there haven't been the corresponding studies in any uh, respect, uh, anywhere near as much, for other forms of cannabis. The smoked and vaporized cannabis clinical trials only amount to three patient years. That means one person using cannabis daily for three years or 300 using uh, for a much shorter period of time. In comparison, Sativex, the randomized control trials there and monitoring is over 6,000 patient years. So obviously a big, big difference. Just to go over a few of the clinical trials, um, these are in cancer pain studies. Uh, there have been two of these published. One was for two weeks in a hospice population in Europe, and the other was uh, for uh, five weeks, and it was done in many countries around the world, including um, patients in Australia, uh, which is the reason I've previously visited you for a short time. There's also been a long-term extension where people with cancer who survived longer and continued the medicine had their observations added. What was interesting there was for the people who gained pain control, it did not subside over time. Normally we expect people to increase their opioid dose. That didn't happen. And they didn't increase their Sativex dose either. And although a lot of the patients subsequently succumbed, they did not have an increase in their pain levels. So showing the utility in the long term. So again, as I mentioned, the first trial was two weeks. They used a thing called the numeric rating scale. What's your pain on a scale of zero to 10, comparing Sativex to placebo. And they looked at various things, including responder analysis, which is a way of looking at how someone did over the long term. Not just an individual day, but what were the overall trends. Um, the gold standard in pain is the group that has a 30% decrease in pain over time. That's highly significant to the patient. And that was 43% of the patients on Sativex versus 21% on placebo. And uh, the probability of that happening due to chance is only six in 1,000. So that's quite statistically significant. Now, if we look at the 30% level here, you see something very interesting because this was a three-part study. They looked at placebo, just regular drugs, their opioids, because these patients were all resistant, had pain despite the best that medicine could provide, morphine or other drugs for pain, and had these things added in. So they had placebo added in, they had tetranabinex added in, that's a high THC extract, full spectrum, but no clonabidiol, and that's in blue. Placebo's in gray. The orange is Sativex. The only difference between the, the blue that didn't work compared to placebo and the orange is the addition of cannabidiol. So this is the first salient demonstration of the synergy of cannabidiol with THC and the other components in the plant in pain control. And again, this is a continuous response analysis, so we're looking at the trends over time, and you see that the pain goes down. In the gray, you've got the placebo. Unfortunately, placebo works. It works a lot, uh, and we'll go into this more uh, in the talk tomorrow. It works all too well, so you can have a drug that actually is quite effective, but if the placebo works too well, you won't show a statistically significant difference, and it's a negative trial just like the drug was no good, even if it might be. But you see basically in all the time points in uh, this, uh, the phase two studies, 
uh, which were done over five weeks internationally, that there were, it was always a little better than placebo, and again, statistically significant. And looking at the two studies, their uh, probability values, um, as compared to placebo, both show improvement to a significant degree. And now, let's shift into a little bit about clinical trials of nabiximol, Sativex, and multiple sclerosis. Unfortunately, there's only been one study uh, formally in spasticity in recent times with smoked cannabis, and it was effective, but very uh, short duration, limited number of patients. In comparison, you see this whole listing of a series of clinical trials, again, uh, almost all being effective. Um, the study that finally proved things so that approval could happen in 27 countries was this one. Um, this is what's called a, a randomized withdrawal study. And if you look at the graph, initially, unbeknownst to the patients, everyone got Sativex and um, used the amount that would either help with their spasticity, muscle tightness, or um, gave them too many side effects. Um, after a month, only the patients who improved 20% were then continued in the study. And they were then randomized. They came in for a resupply visit. And, um, half the patients got the same number of sprays in the mouth of Sativex the day that they'd taken before. And half got placebo instead. Again, they didn't know who was who. But you see the differences. The lines converge. Uh, I'm sorry, diverge. The people who were getting Sativex afterwards continued to have a decrease in their spasticity levels where those that went on placebo actually got worse um, and then leveled out again. Um, you'll see a, a listing of complex uh, neurophysiological mechanisms of Sativex on spasticity. I'm not going to bore you with those details today, but suffice it to say you can study this uh, when you have time and um, these are quite uh, important. Here's just a little graphic demonstration. Um, the person on the left uh, in the picture has what's called a quinovirus. It's a, a, because of spasticity, the foot is in this funny position. But after treatment with THC CBD, which is Sativex, they don't mention that the terpenoids are there as well. Um, but the feet look the same, and they have relaxed. Um, so uh, again, this was done in patients who had previously taken muscle relaxants, uh, the approved drugs for this condition, but didn't have adequate results. Now, Lucy had asked me to talk about a theory I developed um, and uh, published in 2004 called Clinical Endocannabinoid Deficiency. And I'll again apologize that some of this is pretty technical, um, but I can tell you that everything that we have on these slides is in a big new review article that's been provisionally accepted. When I get home, I need to do a couple of little revisions and then hopefully it'll be published in the next uh, couple of months and it'll be open source. It'll be available to anyone. But the idea of this is, I mentioned the endocannabinoid tone, this baseline level of activity. Everybody has one. I don't know what yours is or what yours is, but it's there somewhere. Uh, this is a reflection of how much endogenous cannabinoid there might be in your brain and other areas of the body, uh, how they're produced, how they're broken down, and how many receptors you have. So a change in any of those could affect someone's level of pain or stiffness in the muscles or their seizure threshold. The theory was that in certain conditions, whether you're born this way or because of something that happens in your life, that the endocannabinoid tone gets too low and that's going to produce disease and symptoms. So that's the theory. Now, in the original paper in 2004, I uh, focused on three areas, migraine, fibromyalgia and irritable bowel syndrome, but there were a whole bunch of other conditions that I thought could be related to this, and you see those listed there, and they extend from hyperemesis gravidarum, which is like morning sickness on steroids, um, and a bunch of other conditions, uh, many psychiatric as well. 
or so-called psychiatric, I should say. Now, there's some interesting reasons to think why those three conditions at the top are related. Um, they're all hyperalgesic states, states in which the person seems to have an excess pain response. Um, but when you look at the tissue, it looks normal. Somebody with fibromyalgia, when you do muscle biopsies, you don't see anything special. Um, and there are no lab tests for them, so they're all clinical diagnoses, a diagnosis based on the patient's described pattern. Um, they're also what are called comorbid. That means that if you've got one, there's a good chance you've got the other, too. Um, so primary headache occurred in 97% of, of 201 patients with fibromyalgia. And then 36% of people who had chronic daily headache, which is a kind of daily migraine, had uh, fibromyalgia. 32% uh, of patients with irritable bowel had fibromyalgia, and 32% of fibromyalgia patients had irritable bowel syndrome. So this big overlap. Unfortunately, attitudes haven't changed very fast because if we have a patient that had all three, it's typically a woman seeing a male physician who's going to diagnose her as having a somatization disorder, which is a modern way of saying that she's a hypochondriac. I maintain to you that this is no such thing, but this is a biochemical disorder, and it might have something to do with not having enough endogenous cannabinoid activity. So let's hone in on these conditions. First, we'll do irritable bowel. This is often thought of as a lifelong condition, but people clearly acquire this. Some people will have bad oysters, they have diarrhea for three weeks, and then they've got this condition continuing, and they do uh, bacterial cultures and everything else, they find nothing, and they're stuck with this condition. Um, and it can go on forever. Um, it's the most frequent diagnosis amongst gastroenterologists in the States, and for all I know, the same is likely true here. Um, there are no particular physical signs, but pattern of irregular bowel movements, often diarrhea, although it can be constant constipation, and they can alternate. Um, you know, people go through colonoscopies and blood tests, including for gluten neuropathy. Most often, these are all negative. Um, but uh, it's been described as a disorder of unknown origin as being treated by agents with an unknown mechanism of action. Um, there are a lot of drugs for this that don't work really well, um, as anybody who's had this condition knows. And so maybe they're barking up the wrong pharmacological tree, and the target should be the endocannabinoid system in, instead. Patients who have this have gut pain almost all the time, and things that shouldn't hurt, hurt a lot. Um, if there's an area in the, the intestine that's distended too big, it hurts. Um, and that's called a visceral hypersensitivity. Um, and uh, again, this overabundance of pain. This work by Smith et al. was done in Australia, I'm happy to say. Uh, they looked at the muscles in the gut um, from surgical specim specimens, and these weren't necessarily patients who had, uh, they may have had a variety of conditions, but what they found was that anandamide co-localized with cholinergic neurons. That's the primary mover uh, of the gut. Um, but it was clear that it performed a modulatory role on how fast or how slowly things go through the gut. Um, what they suggested was the endocannabinoid system seemed to be upregulated in diseases that produced inflammation in the gut, and that certainly would be true of irritable bowel as well. Um, this is a study where they looked at dronabinol, synthetic THC, uh, in uh, 52 normal patients and basically showed uh, that it produced changes in tone uh, and pressure in the gut. Um, so just basically proof that this does have a role there. Um, some research done at the Mayo Clinic, actually two studies, um, they were looking at genetic markers of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, they found uh, this thing called uh, CNRI, which has to do with cannabinoid uh, function, um, that uh, patients who had um, uh, 
increased frequency of stools uh, with irritable bowel um, responded to THC. Um, similarly, in the second study, uh, that um, the CB1 receptor seemed to modify uh, the speed through the gut. Um, so again, just a gloss over that. Now, there's some interesting relationships to diet. I know we're here to talk about cannabis, but it's important to understand too that what you eat also has an effect on this. And if you eat the right things, you might not need cannabis as much. So I'm interested in cannabis being utilized pharmacologically. I'm also interested in patients getting better. And it may be that both are needed. This is a study um, that looked at lactobacilli. So this is what's in yogurt. These are normal inhabitants of the healthy gut. Um, and what they showed was this gene uh, that has to do with the cannabinoid uh, receptor, CB2, its expression of RNA um, was affected by taking this as a supplement. Um, and um, this actually enhanced the pain reducing properties of morphine. And it was opposed if you took a CB2 antagonist, a drug that would reduce that function. Um, in this study, they looked at probiotics. So this include lactobacilli, uh, yogurt and the like, um, or kefir. Um, and they looked at studies where probiotics were taken as supplements, and 32, uh, 34 out of 42 trials showed a beneficial effect um, on irritable bowel symptoms. So they had less pain, less bloating, and, um, and some other functions. Um, and uh, over five to six months, taking lacto lactic acid bacteria produced a stabilization of the bacteria in the gut. Um, so they did cultures on those. A very recent study looked at a phenomenon that's previously been reported. Uh, everyone knows that cannabis with THC increases appetite, so why aren't people who use it regularly all fat, as you'd expect? The archetype of the hippie is a skinny guy who uses cannabis, not a fat guy who uses cannabis. Um, so we have a bit of a contradiction. But in fact, THC altered the bacterial balance in the gut. Uh, this is done in mice, but likely the same thing happens in humans. And there are two kinds of bacteria that are important called Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. Um, but um, what happened, and the key point here, is in these mice that have a genetic predisposition to being obese, that THC prevented weight gain uh, through this change in the balance of bacteria. Okay? So supplemental THC in the form of cannabis can have this effect. And with diet, in addition, it may be all the better. So we've heard about probiotics. They're also prebiotics. Prebiotics are vegetable matter that feeds the good bacteria, their preferred food in the gut. Um, the chemicals involved with this are called inulin and fructooligosaccharides, or FOS for short. Um, these don't get broken down in the stomach, and they're fermented by these gut bacteria. And there are over a thousand species, and again, the balance that this person has and that person has is going to be quite different. When people have these vegetables that I'll show you in their diet, it stimulates the growth and activity of the bifidobacteria and the lactobacilli that are good for the health. Um, it's estimated that ancient humans had a lot more of these vegetables in their diets than we do today, where uh, a French fry may be considered a vegetable, but it's not one of the ones you want for this. Um, so modern humans might only have a few grams a day of these. The best sources are these acacia fiber, gum arabic, chicory, burdock, sunchokes, and a lot of those are probably unfamiliar to you, but hopefully onions, leek, and garlic uh, might be in your diet. When these are eaten, they reduce infectious diarrhea, they alleviate inflammatory bowel diseases, they reduce cancer risk in the gut, 
on the increased absorption of minerals, lower cardiac risk, and decreased obesity. So that's quite a list of things that you can do with this minor dietary change. To focus on one agent, which is acacia fiber, which is available commercially, um, this is, comes from the sap of a tree in Africa, Acacia Senegal. Uh, it's a premier prebiotic. So this isn't digested, it serves as food for those bacteria. Um, there was a trial done where they looked at this, uh, 10 grams a day, which would be like a big uh, heaping tablespoon full of this stuff that can be mixed into food or a smoothie or juice. And that increased the lactobacilli sixfold compared to water, and, um, and it also increased this bacteroidetes balance. Um, it seemed to reduce Clostridium difficile, which is an, uh, a gut bacterium when it, uh, it's often a hospital acquired infection, and when somebody's got it, they could have diarrhea for years until it's taken care of. And just an array of the prebiotics uh, uh, includes dandelion greens. You've got the acacia on the top left, um, sunchokes or Jerusalem artichokes, burdock root, which is popular in oriental cuisines, and then the familiar leek, garlic, and onions. Um, all of this material is in an article that was just published. I just got word yesterday, published online. I'd be happy to be sent to you. Um, now, we're going to transition into fibromyalgia. This is a study by Schley et al. They looked at nine uh, patients with fibromyalgia, which is a painful disease of the muscles. Um, and they took THC up to 15 milligrams a day. Uh, oddly, in Germany, their ethics committee wouldn't let them use a placebo. God knows why. but. Um, because THC on its own is a very problematic drug without those added uh, entourage compounds in cannabis that make it more acceptable on a side effect uh, standpoint, uh, five of nine dropped out. So only four took all of it all for the entire duration. But they had a decrease in allodynia, which is touch feeling like burning pain or this overreaction to pain called hyperalgesia. Um, they had reduction in pain overall that was statistically significant. If we look at that in gra graphic form, the chances that this could happen due to chance would be only one in 100, so that's statistically significant. Um, Nabilone is a semi-synthetic THC. It's marketed in some countries. Um, it's about uh, 10 times the potency of THC, so not good from uh, an acceptability standpoint to patients. Um, they looked at 40 patients that got nabilone one twice a day, which would be about the same as 20 of THC, so it's a pretty high dose, actually. After four weeks, they looked at visual analog scales where the patient judged their pain, um, a thing called the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire and their anxiety levels and all of those were statistically improved. Um, but it wasn't uh, a drug that patients typically can take over the long, a long period of time with any success. Our friend uh, Mark Ware in Canada looked at nabilone compared to amitriptyline, which is one of the standard drugs taken for fibromyalgia. Um, and they just looked at sleep, um, and in fact, in that study, although sleep was improved, and that's one of the hallmarks of fibromyalgia is a sleep disturbance. It's always there, 100%. Um, a patient won't get better until that's dealt with. Um, so it is important to get the sleep, and cannabinoids can help. However, in this study, there was no benefit on the pain. This was actually a study done with smoke cannabis in Spain um, in patients with fibromyalgia. Uh, but it was only done uh, acutely. They looked at pain, stiffness, relaxation, sleepiness, and well-being. Um, 28 patients with cannabis, 28 controls, and after two hours, those parameters with the asterisks were all statistically improved. Um, however, the mental health component summary was also higher in the people that got cannabis, meaning that 
they had psychoactive side effects in this instance. Um, we can be almost positive this is a high THC variety with no cannabidiol because that's what was around in Spain at the time. Now, I'm not usually big on surveys, but this one's fascinating. This was an, in a thing called the National Pain Report uh, that was done a couple of years ago. Uh, they looked at 1,300 patients with fibromyalgia and they asked for their uh, benefits from taking three Food and Drug Administration approved drugs, duloxetine, milnasopran, and pregabalin. And uh, red means they had no benefit. Green means it was very effective and yellow helps a little and you'll see a lot of red for the approved drugs compared to cannabis where over 60% had a really good result, it was very effective and uh, only 5% had no benefit. So I ask you what's the better drug uh, for treating fibromyalgia? Sort of no contest. Now, we're going to move into migraine, and I'll again apologize the, that some of this is pretty technical, but for a common condition, migraine is probably the most biochemically complex afflic affliction of people. I've been spending my entire professional career trying to understand it and treat it. Um, this looked at women with migraine. And they were looking at a thing called the anandamide membrane transporter and the activity of pha. Pha is fatty acid amide that breaks down uh, anandamide in the body. They looked at platelets um, in the blood because we can't take samples of the brain in living patients. That isn't approved by ethics. Um, and they compared patients with chronic headaches versus controls and um, Interestingly, the levels of uh, CB1 were equivalent in the platelets of the two groups, but the women with migraine had an increased degradation rate of anandamide and decreased platelet levels that could indicate a deficiency that was contributing to the migraine. Uh, and I've got more of these. Um, Ackerman et al. did a series of studies, again, looking at uh, endocannabinoid function in migraine. One of the things that migraine does is make blood vessels too big or too small. That's not the cause of the disease. It's what's called an epiphenomenon, a secondary effect. Um, anandamide reduced blood vessel diameter in the dura, the covering of the brain, 30%. Um, and uh, worked through a complex biochemical mechanism and it was felt on the basis of all this stuff that anandamide has a tonic level of activity, again a baseline level of activity, and modifies a thing called the trigeminovascular system which is the pathophysiological mechanism of migraines. Another study on blood vessels, again uh, showing involvement of the trip v one subset of uh, uh, endocannabinoid uh, receptors. And a third, um, also, this is a synthetic cannabinoid called WIN, um, looking at uh, the uh, synaptic activity, um, and um, it suggested that CB1 agonists read THC or things like it, have therapeutic therapeutic potential in migraine and cluster headache, although the authors, as many authors are in this kind of literature, were fearful of the psychoactive side effects. However, that neglects the fact that often a very low dose that isn't psychoactive is sufficient to treat these disorders, or that you can mitigate the side effects of THC through the presence of cannabidiol or terpenoids. Probably the best piece of evidence that's come up down the line of this theory of clinical endocannabinoid deficiency is on this slide. This is a study I proposed in 2004, but in the United States I realized that we could never get this through an ethics committee because what I suggested was looking at cerebrospinal fluid levels of the endocannabinoids in patients with migraine. And this isn't normally tested. This requires a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, so-called. But what they did in this study is looked at normals, 
How they got them to agree to have a spinal tap is beyond me, but this was done in Italy. Uh, maybe they were more convincing with their ethics. Um, but you see the level on the left in the controls as compared to that on the right in the patients with uh, chronic migraine, and there's a one chance in 10,000 that this result was done to chance. This is real. This is as good as being biopsy proven. So what the author said was reduced anandamide levels in the cerebral spinal fluid of chronic migraine, migraine patients support the hypothesis of the failure of this endogenous cannabinoid system in chronic migraine. And then they went on uh, to state how this worked. But basically, this is proof of the theory, I believe. More studies from Italy, um, both 2AG and anandamide, both of the major endocannabinoids, levels were markedly reduced in the platelets of migraine, uh, chronic migraine patients as compared to controls. Again, very highly statistically significant. Uh, another study out of Italy, uh, this is actually an animal model of migraine. One of the things it can do is produce these bizarre sensory phenomenon like scintillating scotomatas. That's a way of saying that you lose vision on one side and you've got sparkles there. And it comes about due to a depression on the surface of the brain. In this animal model, they were able to show um, that this, um, that the endocannabinoid system is involved and presumably agents like THC and cannabis could prevent this and many patients report this. If they have this aura of migraine with this sensory phenomenon, they can use cannabis right away and prevent the attack from becoming full blown. There is a genetic predispos predisposition to migraine. This has been mapped uh, to be related to CB1 gene, CNR1, which is on chromosome 6. Um, and um, interestingly, the patients had the strongest evidence for this gene also uh, had the highest likelihood of having migraine phenomena like sensitivity of the eyes to light, nausea, and significant disability with their headaches. And for anybody who's had one, they know what I'm talking about. Uh, also, there were some so-called personality traits, including neuroticism, whatever that is, depression, and a tendency towards um, drug dependence were higher in these patients. But um, someone who has this chronically is obviously going to be trying to treat it with one substance or another. Um, this was just out a couple of months ago. This is from Colorado. Now this is a biased sample. These are patients that went to a clinic where they used cannabis um, and there were 120 patients with migraine um, and they were treated prophylactically on an ongoing preventive basis uh, with cannabis. 68% um, uh, had used cannabis previously, so it's not everyone. You couldn't generalize this necessarily. But in the patients who then went on to use cannabis regularly, they dropped their attack rate from 10.4 a month to 4.6 a month, which is, again, very, very highly st significant. Uh, they also had um, reduced headache frequency. Um, and were able to abort or stop their headaches uh, when they used it acutely. Again, this is a selected population. We need to do the same thing in randomized controlled trials. I've been trying for 20 years and it still hasn't happened. Um, my friend John McPartland uh, wrote what I call the article of the decade uh, called The Care and Feeding of the Endocannabinoid System, which I think is also the article title of the decade. Um, he looked at the issue of clinical endocannabinoid deficiency and uh, listed these other authors whose work in these different conditions uh, also seem to be supportive of the concept. And in the paper that I hope is going to be published soon, uh, we go into some of these areas in, in greater detail. So something to look forward to. Um, where do we go from here with this concept? Um, clearly, we need better studies of irritable bowel, fibromyalgia and migraine, uh, looking at things like levels in the blood, maybe in the cerebral spinal fluid. It'd be better to do this with scans of the brain, but right now we don't have great tools this way. There is active research, 
So it'd be great if you could go in and assess your endocannabinoid function or how dense your cannabinoid receptors in the brain without having a needle stuck in your back. Um, additionally, we need better work genetically. Uh, there are companies now looking at markers for these diseases and trying to correlate them with endocannabinoid function. What we really need, and the only thing is that going to convince physicians and politicians is controlled clinical trials of cannabis-based medicines in these conditions, preferably with enriched designs like I showed uh, for Sativex and spasticity. Um, this was the last uh, paragraph from the paper in 2004 I'll read to you. Only time and the scientific method will ascertain whether a new paradigm is applicable to human physiology and the treatment of its derangements. Our insight into these possibilities is dependent on the, on the contribution of one unique healing plant. For clinical cannabis has become a therapeutic compass to what modern medicine fails to cure. So, last slide. It is critical to understand that cannabis is a plant that modulates the endocannabinoid system, which itself is an innate homeostatic regulator of human physiology. If there's too much of something, it brings it back into balance. Too little of something, it brings it up into balance. Cannabidiol is a particularly promising therapeutic endocannabinoid system modulator. So in the future, we should have more of that and maybe just a little THC. The endocannabinoid system also is influenced by lifestyle and dietary factors. Primary among these would be low impact exercise, uh, an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant diet, and uh, things like the probiotics and prebiotics, which seem to be a proven value in the conditions we've discussed. So with that, I'll close my first talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ethan Rousseau.